Hey, thanks for tuning in for our online church service this weekend. Getting into our third week of Advent, so let's jump right into some prayer. Father God, we are just thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to uh, focus on what the real reason for this season is, Lord, which is you, Jesus, the birth of your Son, good Lord, and uh, him coming into the world, Lord, to, to really walk out the steps of an example for us to follow as well as the opportunity after his death to to believe in him and to restore some relationship with you lord that we would have salvation and the opportunity to to find ourselves in heaven with you lord lord thank you so much let that rest in us with a joy this season lord in jesus name amen well like i said you know we've been on this advent season we're getting really close to Christmas now. As a matter of fact, those of you who want to do the countdown to Christmas, there's 12 days of Christmas. So if you're one of those people who like to count that down, are you ready for today to be that parsonage in a pear tree? You know, every day one of my kids comes to me and tells me how excited they are that, that Christmas is getting closer and closer every single day. You know, we're, we're here in the third week of Advent and um, it's, it's really... It's really getting exciting. Decorations are going up. People are getting excited and all the things going on. Um, stores are a little bit busier. Uh, people are thinking about things for each other and gifting each other, caring for each other in different ways and preparing for parties and things. And, and it's just, just an excitement. And it's a good time to have that reminder and all the excitement coming that there is a reason for this season and that we should focus on that. In the first week, of, of the Advent series, we talked about the idea of being prepared for the miraculous things God's going to do this season. We used the story of Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth to help us prepare for the miracles that are going to happen right here and right now in the seasons of our life. I hope everyone is seeing those miracles around them, and I, and I hope everyone has got an anticipation and an expectation about them that, that the Lord is doing miracles right in your life and with people that you know right now. Last week, we used the story of Mary and, and her interaction with the angel and her becoming pregnant by the Holy Spirit and him overshadowing her and used that to prepare us using Mary as an example on how we can be prepared to be an instrument for God to use this season to accomplish these miracles he's going to accomplish in people's lives. You know, this week, we're going to look at the story of Joseph and um, Jesus's earthly father here. Last week, we left uh, Mary, and she, she really gave us that, that good example of, of what to strive for in being, being ready for God to use us this season. But in turn, her story left us at a place where now she is, she's pregnant, and we're picking up after that story and where that left off where now Joseph is entering the picture. And so um, he's Jesus's earthly father and we're going to see an example in him where he's going to be able to show us through the scriptures ways we can glean to prepare for an encounter with Jesus. And what I mean by that is, is how prepared are you to meet your Savior this, this season? How prepared are you to help someone walk through choosing to meet Jesus this, this season? Are you ready for that? Because the last two weeks have been preparing us for the expectation that, that there are plenty of people that still need to have that encounter with Jesus and accept him. And we should be praying and expecting that to happen. And then last week, how we, we learned that we can become an instrument for God to use to help lead people to that place. And today, I want to talk about how we can continually lead people to the place of that encounter with Jesus in meeting the Savior. And so, are you prepared to meet the Savior in your life right now? Are you prepared to help the people that you know around you, the people in life, meet Jesus this season? And are you expecting it? I think if we find ourselves in Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25, this is, this is the basis behind all the Advent series uh, that I'm working on. And it's the idea of the Christmas joy. The fact that, that it's all gonna come together in that joy in the scripture. And that we should stand on that. But in that then we should be prepared because we want everyone who has not accepted and encountered the Savior 
we want everyone to experience that joy, the joy that you can only get from the Lord. So let's jump right into verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of the Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save the, his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> behold, the virgin shall conceive shall conceive and bear a son and there shall they shall he shall be called Emmanuel which means God with us so when Joseph woke from the sleep he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him he took his wife but but knew her not until she had given birth to her son and he called him Jesus you know how ready do you think Joseph was for this kind of news I mean, at this point, he, he and Mary had already gotten into the level of engagement. So they were going to get married. Everything was falling into place. And then all of a sudden, she shows up and she's pregnant. And she's saying that she's pregnant with the Holy Spirit inside of her. Okay, How do you think Joseph received that news? We can read in that that he still cared for her. He still wanted everything to quietly be able to to process and for her and him to divorce quietly in a way that she wouldn't have shame on her head. You know, being faced with knowing and having to prepare for this, this marriage um, really left them in a tough spot. How do you speak of marriage? Let's take a minute to, to think about marriage in general. You know, marriage is a funny thing. I've heard people speak very, very well of marriage. I've, I've heard people speak very, very poorly of it. I've heard people make jokes out of it. You know, I believe marriage is a sacred and purposeful commitment. That marriage should be something that we use that reflects Jesus in our life and through our life. What I mean by that is if we look at what Mary and Joseph were going through in the process of, of getting married, it has, it has three parts to it in the biblical times. So it varies a little differently from what we do today. But basically, in biblical times, for these two to be married, the very first thing that has to happen is the two families have to sit down and they both have to agree on this marriage. And then the second part is, is there's got to be a public announcement, like, like letting everyone know I'm engaged. That would probably be the closest thing to when people say that they're, they're now have a fiance and not a boyfriend or girlfriend, that they are officially engaged. The difference between our engagements today versus the engagements of the biblical times is that the only way that that could be broken at that point was by official divorce or by one of them actually dying. And then later they would be married and begin living together. So in the time of an engagement, the man would basically go off and build a room or a separate home that most, most of the time was connected somehow to his parents or family's property or the home themselves. Some of them just built an additional room off of the house that was there. Once that was completed, he was allowed to take his, his groomsmen and basically go and get his wife and bring her home. When we look at this, there's, there's some reflections to how marriage is and, and a reflection of life in the Lord. And let's talk about that for a minute because God offers us a union with him through Jesus. And we have to both sit down and agree on that, all parties involved. The thing about it is we know Jesus is always ready and he's always willing to accept us when we want to give our life to him. We know that anybody who chooses to accept Jesus Christ, that his hand is out there willing to do it. The thing about that is, is it has to be received. So both parties, very much like the marriage with the families, both parties involved have to agree to do it because Jesus isn't going to do it all for us and we can't do it on our own without him. 
So we all have to agree to come together. And then the second part of the marriage was that engagement, that announcement that goes out. If you look at what it means to be saved, once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we, we publicly announce, we confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart. We also, uh, baptism is the next biblical step for a believer to, to show outwardly uh, to everyone the inward choice that they had made, very much so, like that example of the engagement of the public announcement in that. And then we look at the fact that uh, when we have that, that we have a relationship with Jesus in that time. When the husband is done and goes and retrieves his wife, the scripture says, go and live with them. Okay, so it will cleave to one another, the scriptures say. They're going to do life together from that point on. And it's such a good picture of once we give our life to the Lord, once we've, once we've, we've decided and we have publicly said, yes, we are, we are going to believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our relationship with him starts when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And when that happens, we get to figure out how the rest of our life works, living with him at the same time. You know, our marriages can absolutely reflect that. It can reflect the gospel. It can reflect the gospel through different ways. It can be by how we live out our roles as one another, how we live out our commitment to one another and to him, and also how we love each other in our marriages. The, a, a, a good, righteous marriage can be a picture-perfect example of the gospel and a relationship with Jesus. You know, because Mary and Joseph were engaged in this time, Mary apparently unfaithful, according to what everyone would have known, because she was carrying a child outside of the realm of what that, what that marriage requirement would have been. And the thing about that is Mary, Mary's unfaithfulness in that would have brought a real heavy social judgment on her and on Joseph both, but mostly on her. And Joseph had a right to divorce her in this time. And the Jewish authorities at the time absolutely had a right to be able to stone her in this time. Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24 actually tells us that if there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city and you shall stone them to death with stone the young woman because she did not cry for help and though she was in the city and the man because he violated his neighbor's wife so you shall purge the evil from your midst can you imagine being joseph at this time and figuring out this news he would have known because of the scriptures that his wife could be stoned he he would have known the judgment and and all that would have came with it from the community because of what was going on in this time what would have been going through his mind at that time always is always something that's baffled me because Joseph is an interesting Bible character no matter how you cut it. He plays a very significant role in the Bible because he's Jesus' earthly father. But he disappears from the scenes really quick. As a matter of fact, we don't know anything about him uh, beyond Jesus and his, his young boyhood in, a, in about Luke 2. That's the last that we hear of Joseph. Now, tradition would say, and Theologians have argued that, that basically he, he probably had just passed away even before Jesus started his, his earthly ministry. But what we can tell from the scriptures is that, that Joseph was a good man. We can see that in this story here, how he treated Mary, his heart behind it, the fact that he was obedient to the Lord and obedient to the angel and his message. He had more, more than, he had more than likely been brought up learning about the prophecies, the law, the history of Israel and everything to come. So he would have heard about the coming Messiah, expecting him to come someday. A lot of people today, I think are very much so like Joseph was in this time. And what I mean by that is plenty of people have heard about religion, heard about God, heard about church, heard about Jesus. But there are a lot of them that have never had an encounter with him that have put them in a place where they've accepted him as their Lord and Savior and had a personal relationship with him. You know, I, I, I resort back to my 
my upbringing. I've gone to church most of my life. Um, always went almost every single Sunday with my mom or my grandma. Uh, my grandfather was a pastor. Um, just, just went all the time. But in that time, I never had that specific encounter with the Savior. The one where I would give him my life. I accepted the grace that he gave me in the salvation through Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so because of that, I think there are so many people out there who know of God, but don't know him. Who know the idea of church and Jesus and, and, and these things, but don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, that's what it takes for us to be saved, is once we give our life to him to be able to give that then we gain that personal relationship. Like the marriage that said they would pick up their wife and, and then bring them home and they would live together. When we give our life to Jesus, the rest of our life is living with Jesus together. As a marriage, it's just not my wife and I, it's my wife and I and the Lord. And it's the three of us in this marriage together where he is the center of all that we do. Joseph was a man they had learned all about the history and the law, but he had not met the Savior yet. What God said to Joseph, he wants us to say to those who haven't met him yet either. We need to be prepared to share for people to meet Jesus this season. We know that miracles are coming. We know God's going to use us as an instrument. Now we need to do our part and share with everyone about who Jesus really is. So God has a message about the Savior he wants us to get out. The first one is, is that we need to realize that God is at work in our lives and their lives just the same. Whether they know him or not, or you know him or not, God is working in both our lives. We need to be prepared because God has been working in our lives. We need to be prepared because he is working in the lives of the people who have still not met him yet. I don't believe for a second that Joseph and Mary became the earthly parents of Jesus by accident. I believe that they were chosen for this task. We're not given insight exactly why God chose them, and it really doesn't matter in the end. But what we can see is that he arranged the timing of their lives. That means that Jesus came at the perfect time in the perfect place. That means that God is doing in people's lives a work that means there's going to come a perfect time and a perfect place for them to meet him or for someone to show them him. Are you ready to do that? You know, if we're going to be a part of this, we have to be prepared ourselves. We have to know God is setting the stage for that encounter, that encounter with Jesus for them who don't know him those who still are looking because they're lost and they haven't been found. He arranged things today that they could be here in this place possibly. Maybe where you go this week it was arranged so that you two, you and someone else could be there with the opportunity to talk about accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have to prepare ourselves to be faithful, available, and teachable so that we can be used as an instrument for God. Then we will find ourselves in a place to be prepared for someone to meet Jesus. My wife uh, quite often does an event called a women's tea. And so every once in a while she'll put together a women's tea. And as part of the women's tea, she likes to get a lot of different women that, that are around in the area. And they basically sponsor a table. And in sponsoring a table, they would decorate and, and set up all the serving stuff on the table that they want to set up and how they would want to set that up. And there's something that my wife always tells them to help give them an idea of what they're decorating that has always, always stuck with me, and I'll never forget it. She says, when you're setting the table, set the table for an encounter with Jesus. Think about what that means. That idea that you're setting the stage, you're setting the table so someone can have an encounter with Jesus. Are you helping set things up in your life for other people? by sharing, by showing, by caring? Are you helping set the stage? Are you setting the table for that encounter for Jesus? See, God is always at work in us, around us, through us. We can either sleep through his activity or respond to what he's doing. I hope that you'll want to be involved in what God is doing in your life right now. You know, another thing 
that God wants in getting his message out is God is providing all of us a savior. Now, oftentimes we say that, but we have to understand that Jesus is for everyone. He's for those that we love. He's for those that we don't. He's for those that we can't stand. He's for those that we don't know. He's even for those that we would consider to be an enemy of ours. God provided Jesus to be the savior of the world for everyone. And I, for one, am glad for that because I will never do enough good in my life to ever deserve the gift of salvation that he has given. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, but for we are his, his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, we need to know that Jesus is for everyone. If we are prepared, then we will, we will know when God prompts us, when the Holy Spirit comes and says, you need to say something here, you need to do something here, you need to go here. He will prompt us for an encounter with him personally in our life. That encounter when we, when we know him as our Lord and Savior are either reaching out to others, change or reflection or overcoming things in our life. He will also prompt us to share because Jesus is the answer for everyone who is lost. So we all know people in our lives that don't know Jesus. When we get the prompting from the Holy Spirit, we need to be prepared to deliver that message. You know, Joseph, Joseph learned two vital truths about Jesus in this, in this scripture. And in his day, when the angel spoke to him, these two truths are the same truths that we need today and that we need to carry that message through throughout our lives with the people that don't know him. The first thing that we need to know is that Jesus is the incarnated God. This is important. When we read in the scripture of the Holy Ghost coming upon her and that she would be Come pregnant and that you will have a son and you will name him Jesus, which is Emmanuel, which is God with us. You know, that's saying that Jesus is both God and fully man. So we have to know, and I mean know, that we need to explain that to others. He possessed all the qualities of a regular human being, physically, emotionally, intellectually, yet he was above the possibility of sin. You know, having been born of a virgin and not having received an earthly father's sin nature, he knows, he knows how to be human. That's important. We have to know what that means and we have to be able to share that with people. He also possessed every attribute of God. He had his omnipotence, which is all-powerful, had his omniscience, which is all-knowing, he never ceased to be God, yet be fully human at the same time. God in the flesh. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says it like this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every kneel, knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we prepare people to meet Jesus, we need to give them the truth. The truth is that he was fully God and that he is fully man, and they need to know him in a personal relationship. The second vital truth that people need to know is that Jesus is a heaven-sent Savior. What I mean by that is not only is he incarnate, but he came with a purpose. What that means is that Jesus came with a mission. A matter of fact, Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Save, but also seek. So we should also be seeking out lost to prepare them to meet Jesus, to meet their Savior. Jesus came to glorify God by completing the work that God had had him do 
in his time here. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And through whoever comes through the Father, no one can come through the Father except through me. Why? What was that work he was doing? Well, an earthly ministry of preaching salvation. His ministry ended in death that would accomplish salvation for all of us that choose to believe in him as our Lord and Savior. Jesus was all about the redemption of mankind. We too need to be prepared and to be a part of that mission and redemption of all mankind should be a part of what we chase after every single week of our life. We should be behind him and chasing after what he was about if we are going to be in his likeness. So where does that all come from? And we, we need to change our life possibly. We might need to engage where we're not engaging. We might need to, to put some fear aside. We might need to learn a little bit more so we have the confidence to share in season and out of season. We need to be prepared to tell others about his story and what he did. You know, another thing about him being a heaven sent savior that we have to, to let people know, we have to believe in, is that Jesus has given us a great commission as well. John 20, 21, it says, As the Father has sent me, and so I send you. Not only has Jesus come to seek and save the lost of mankind, he has also commissioned all of his people, all of us who have given our life to him, with his saving power to help them understand and see him. That we are commissioned to share, not only to believe in our heart, but out of our heart, our actions should overflow in the belief in knowing the importance of having Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I think everyone this week, especially being that it's the Christmas season, it's Jesus' birth, I believe that the harvest is ripe. I believe that everyone this week should pick one person that is on your mind that you don't know, that you know doesn't know the Lord. I think that you should pick that one person and you should share Jesus with them this week. You should offer accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I think you should put their name somewhere. I think you should pray for them throughout your day, every single day. And then when the time is right, make a phone call, ask for a coffee meeting, have them over for dinner, whatever you need to do, and offer them God's story. Introduce them to Jesus. Set the table for that encounter. I can tell you without a doubt, it goes much better when you're prepared and when you're ready. And what I mean by that is here a few weeks ago, I was in, uh, in our local grocery store and my youngest was with me and we were picking up just a few things. Well, we had just talked with someone from the church and, and we were talking about uh, church and the message and some scripture and, and Jesus. And all of a sudden I was checking out and then I look over and, and uh, I hear behind me, he says, oh, do you, know, do you know who Jesus is? And I turned around and my six-year-old is talking to some lady that he doesn't know and basically asking her, do you know Jesus? I was so busy getting groceries, it totally took me off guard. Well, in doing that, when you turn around and you're not ready, you have a response. What would be your response when you're not ready? I can promise you that when you're prepared and when you're ready, that you're more likely to engage and invite someone to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, being caught off guard, I was lucky enough to know that she knew him and me, and we both know that she is already a believer. So she was very sweet to let him continue to share and to practice. But what would you have done being caught off in that time? Because when we get caught off guard, there's a possibility that we won't engage, we won't share, and we won't offer someone the opportunity to meet their Savior. You know, the, the, the last thing about Jesus being a, a heavenly sent Savior is that God is inviting everyone to respond to his gift. And this is important because we are being asked to respond to the gift he has given us. Others need that opportunity to respond to it. Maybe they've never been asked, never, maybe they've never been invited, maybe they've never been told, maybe they've never been shared with. My wife has gone through all of her, her school career and was never once invited to a church. So she invites more than anyone I know. Take this season an opportunity to invite someone to sit down and have the blessing and the joy that Christmas can bring by them meeting 
their Savior. You know, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments of every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, we need to be ready and prepared to respond. Joseph had a choice in this matter. God had given him clear instructions to go ahead and marry his wife, Mary. He had to take captive the thoughts of not doing it after he was told. Joseph had to decide to obey. Imagine all that Joseph would have missed out on if he would have said no. What happens if you say no? What is it that you miss out on when you say no to the things that God may be asking you to do? What happens for those that you are reaching and you finally get to the place to offer and they say no? What is it they miss out on? You know, God has given you this opportunity and he's ordered your steps in life to bring you to a moment of decision about Christ or to introduce someone to Jesus. But if everyone or anyone in that situation says no, what is missed out on? We miss out on life together. We miss out in eternity together. You know, Jesus came to offer eternal life and want that yes from everyone. If you have responded with a yes to the Lord, then you know your work isn't done. But we still have to fight throughout this life to offer people this message, this message of hope that would bring joy at a season like this. We have to not only be prepared for the miracles that we know are coming, we have to be prepared for God to use us as that instrument. We have to be faithful, we have to be available, and we have to be teachable. And then we have to be prepared to get the message of the Savior to them, to help set the table for that encounter with Jesus. But when we do that, the forces of evil are going to fight against us. And my prayer would be for today that you don't let those forces of evil come to you, that you know the truth. You would not let that be snatched from those you're trying to share with, that you're trying to introduce Jesus to, that you wouldn't let the, e the evil overtake in the world. And I want to leave you with this last scripture that says that. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, I came to give life and life to its fullest. May you stand firm in your relationship with Jesus, what you've been commissioned to, to realize everyone deserves the opportunity to have Jesus Christ offered to them as their Lord and Savior. And that it's our responsibility and believers to help them achieve that. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful, Lord. Lord, I pray that everybody watching and listening, Lord, that they would pick that one person this week to call, to sit down with, to text, and to just introduce you to them, Lord, and then offer to them the opportunity to choose you as Lord and Savior. Because as a gift that you give us, Lord, we have to accept it. We have to receive it. We can't just say, oh, thank you. We have to receive the gift that you give us. So, Lord, I would ask those who don't know you, Lord, that we have the opportunity this season to share you. And, Lord, those who know you, may they have the opportunity to offer your gift of salvation through you to them with the truth of who you are and the fact that your son died on that cross for our sins and that if we believe in him, that we may have eternal life. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of our weekend online service. Hope to see you next week and have a Merry Christmas.